America faces a big choice on November the 5th. And we who believe in reproductive freedom. He says, you're not going to be a dictator, are you? I said, no, 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 other than they won. Perhaps the most important election in recent history is too close to call. But whatever happens on election day and in the weeks that follow, the America that we thought we knew is gone and it isn't coming back. It's the enemy from within, all the scum that we have to deal with. Join me, Dr Emma Shortis, on After America as we discuss the final weeks of the campaign and how this election will change our world forever. After America is brought to you by the Australia Institute. Subscribe now, wherever you get your podcasts. The fact that we know so little about how the AUKUS decision to buy nuclear submarines was made makes us less safe because we can't have confidence that that procurement process is ever going to end in Australia actually having submarines. Similarly with RoboDebt, if the perpetrators had expected that their wrongdoing would come to light immediately and widely, they would never have gone ahead with it. One for mum, one for dad one for the country. And there has never been a more exciting time to be an Australian. Budgets are about choices, Fran, and you show what you value through the choices you make. This is coal. Don't be afraid. Don't be treasurer. scared. Don't the treasurer knows. I want an economy that works for people, not the other way around. We'll just end up being a third-rate economy in a banana republic. Just G'day and welcome to Follow the Money, the Australia Institute's podcast that explains economics, politics and policy in plain English. I'm your host, Ebony Bennett, Deputy Director at the Australia Institute. Transparency is essential to good government and a thriving democracy. Governments make decisions and enact policies on behalf of the public and the public is entitled to know about how and why these decisions are made, sometimes using public money. But in recent years, government decision-making has often seemed pretty opaque. Now, you've called it the most closely guarded secret since the Second World War. Mm. Is it true that you kept it from most of your National Security Cabinet for almost a year? It is true, other than the Defence Minister and the Foreign Minister. As Prime Minister, Scott Morrison was first among equals. Good answer. But for some ministers, he was also their effective body double. The Governor-General has defended his role, saying the secrecy of the appointments are a matter for the former government. This has been government by deception. Government in secret. They hate whistleblowers. They hate people speaking up. They hate people shining a light on official misconduct. A command and control management style within a toxic culture. When it comes to the NDI. Mr system. Morrison, can I just get you to stick to answering the question a bit more? In our social security policy, our defence procurement and even in climate policy, flimsy excuses obscure even flimsier decision making. So how can we reverse a culture of secrecy? Last week, the Australia Institute, along with our partners at the Human Rights Law Centre, the Whistleblower Justice Fund, the Alliance for Journalists' Freedom and Transparency International Australia, brought together some of the country's biggest champions of transparency at the Transparency Summit 2024. Joining me to talk about the summit and how the Australian government can reverse this culture of secrecy is the Director of our Democracy and Accountability Program, Bill Brown. G'day, Bill. Thanks for having me. Bill, the Australian bureau chief for the New York Times, Damien Cave, once wrote that Australia may well be the world's most secretive democracy. How do you see it? Hmm. I think Australia has a good shot of counting as the world's most secretive democracy. The reality is that Australians have come to expect that information is kept from them and do not even realise what other governments do to make their information public and accessible. One of the most interesting results from the Transparency Summit was to hear about how abnormally secretive Australia is, even relative to other countries that we don't normally see as paragons of openness, the United States most notable among them. So what do you mean by that? Because that really strikes me, I guess, that terminology, abnormally secretive. I mean, what are the comparisons that you're thinking about there? One of the most notable is how other countries approach whistleblowing. We heard from a lawyer in the United States who works with whistleblowers about how the US financially rewards people for blowing the whistle. Now, 
We also heard in the summit about the continuing prosecution of whistleblowers in Australia. So the contrast between the two approaches was extremely stark. Whistleblower rewards in the United States have amounted to literally billions of dollars going to those who blew the whistle and have helped recover many times that amount for the public purse. But there are other examples as well. Uh, The United States, for example, gives members of Congress more access to classified documents. In Australia, even our trusted parliamentary committees do not have access to the kind of information about national security operations that is just taken for granted in the US. Former military lawyer David McBride has been sentenced to five years and eight months jail in the ACT Supreme Court. The first Australian to front a court and the first Australian to go to jail over the alleged war crimes in Afghanistan is the whistleblower that brought the allegations to the public's attention. It started with a raid on Bernard Kaleri's home while he helped the East Timorese in their battle with Australia over an oil and gas treaty in the Timor Sea. In this instance, we shook the hands of the Timorese and we said that we would negotiate a sea boundary in good faith and then we spied on their negotiating team. In 2018, Richard Boyle went public over allegations the Australian Taxation Office was harming taxpayers with heavy-handed debt collection tactics. He thought he was protected under Commonwealth public interest disclosure laws. The dismissal of Richard Boyle's appeal demonstrates the shortcomings in our law. Uh, and underscores the need for urgent reform. For decades, whistleblowers have had to fend for themselves. And today, the need for a whistleblower protection authority is greater than ever. So you mentioned there the laws in the United States that actually reward whistleblowers for coming forward. And I think one of the the summit speakers, Senator David Pocock, is championing the idea of a whistleblower protection agency. How might something like that improve transparency here in Australia? A whistleblower protection authority or agency was originally part of the design of the National Anti-Corruption Commission. So when we went to the election in 2022, we we're expecting that these provisions to protect whistleblowers would be part of the overall package for an anti-corruption watchdog. And the reason why this is so important is because being a whistleblower is an extremely vulnerable position to be in. Whistleblowing carries great risks, personal risks, social risks, even financial and legal risks. It's very common for whistleblowers to suffer reprisals. What a whistleblower protection authority would do is provide support for whistleblowers. That would include legal advice on what their rights are, but also the ability for an agency to take exploratory legal action to test what the limits of whistleblowing laws are. One of the great tragedies of whistleblowing in this country is that whistleblowers have tried to do the right thing only to learn after the fact that courts have interpreted the laws in a more limited way than they were believed to operate. Having an authority that can provide the legal advice and provide legal uh, litigation and exploratory litigation would go a long way to addressing those problems. And it would also enliven the knack. The reality is that a lot of anti-corruption investigations depend on whistleblowing. And so in a real sense, the knack is only part formed in the absence of whistleblower protections. Yeah, that's a really good example because I wanted to ask you about the the National Anti-Corruption Commission or the NAC because it's really billed by this government and I think is in reality, you know, billed as one of the key achievements in terms of transparency and anti-corruption measures and integrity measures of the current government. But, you know, you've mentioned the fact that this particular part, the Whistleblowing Protection Agency, wasn't formed and there's some other key flaws in its operation that you've talked a lot about in our research. Can you just tell me some of those concerns? The most significant way in which the NAC has been limited is in its ability to hold public hearings. Integrity commissions use public hearings to bring evidence to light, to allow the public to see justice being done, and also to have an educative role so people can see what does and doesn't count as corruption. 
It's also been the case, including in New South Wales, that the initiation of a public hearing has led to more witnesses coming forward. If you hold your hearings in secret, all of those benefits are lost. Now, the NAC does have the power to hold public hearings, but it's limited not just to when those public hearings are in the public interest, but even then, only in exceptional circumstances. That's the same restriction that exists in Victoria. And when this legislation was passed, the then commissioner in Victoria, Robert Redlich, himself warned that it had constrained the ability of the Victorian Anti-Corruption Commission to do its job. The NAC is constrained in just the same way. And sure enough, it's been operating for over a year now, and there haven't been any public hearings, including into anti-corruption cases of extreme interest to the public, robo-debt and the Paladin affair, most obvious among them. Yeah, and I know in New South Wales with ICAC there, as you said, in the past, it's really led those public hearings to the public kind of not only seeing further witnesses come forward, but that the public is aware of that wrongdoing. And it means, you know, that all of those things are exposed to the sunlight effectively. So you can see really why that would inspire confidence of people, whereas having nothing like that leaves people wondering in the case of the Paladin affair and robo-debt, kind of questioning, you know, what the hell happened? Why didn't the NAC find anything here? Because they've got nothing else to go on. Exactly right. And in the case of the Paladin affair, there was a a decision from the NAC just in the last couple of weeks. Uh, It found that there wasn't corrupt conduct in the behaviour of a home affairs public servant. But Although the commissioner expressed the hope that that finding would clear the air, in fact, it's quite the opposite. Because we don't know if any other investigations are going on into Paladin, and if they are going on, we don't know their extent, Uh, we're left wondering how, if at all, this serious controversy is going to be addressed. We're talking about the distribution of hundreds of millions of dollars of taxpayer money and all the integrity issues that come around the treatment of asylum seekers and refugees. Now, there could be some other investigation in the pipeline, but so far the public hasn't seen that ventilated. And I think, too, a public hearing, even into the limited matters that the NAC has published on so far, would encourage more of a response from government. Although it should be clear that the NAC did not make an adverse finding, in its investigation, we did hear of public servants who were too busy to update their conflict of interest declarations, who gave a verbal conflict of interest declaration instead of the one in writing as required by policy, and so on. I would have thought that those revelations, particularly if they occurred in a public hearing, should provoke action from government to clean up that problem across the public service, even if there's no wrongdoing in this particular instance. Mm. I want to touch on robo-debt here because it's obviously one of the most infamous examples of a culture of secrecy and the kind of really terrible real-world implications. This is not just, you know, a matter of bureaucracy, but it obviously impacted people's lives massively negatively and, and had enormous consequences for them. So what is the legacy of that unlawful scheme on transparency in Australia? I think there are mixed consequences for transparency. As you say, robo-debt was illegal, it was illogical, and it was cruel, uh, and has been linked to the deaths of Australians. But although we had the benefit of the Royal Commission, which forensically stripped away the veil of secrecy and exposed just what was going on in Cabinet and in departments while the robo-debt affair was playing out, We still haven't really seen a reckoning for the people involved. Um, We know more than ever what they did, but they haven't really been held to account. I think public servants on the whole are probably more on notice that their duties to be transparent, to be frank and fearless, and to give accurate and uh, truthful information. I think on the whole, public servants are more aware of that. 
But the fact that uh, justice has not been done is also going to embolden those who in the future will be faced with similar difficult decisions to make. Mm. We're often told that information really can't be made public because it would be, quote, some kind of a security risk, I guess. So I'm sure that there are genuine reasons why certain information does need to be kept secret. So how can governments really walk that line between genuine security concerns and a genuine need for secrecy and kind of trying to create a culture of disclosure where transparency is paramount, except in those exceptional circumstances mm. where, you know, secrecy is, is required. The reality is at the moment we are so far on the secrecy side of the ledger. And that's because there are incentives to be secret, but very few, if any, to be open and transparent. And that's actually having serious security implications. The fact that we know so little about how the AUKUS decision to buy nuclear submarines was made, for example, makes us less safe because we can't have confidence that that procurement process is ever going to end in Australia actually having submarines. Similarly with robo-debt, if the perpetrators had expected that their wrongdoing would come to light immediately and widely, they would never have gone ahead with it. Australian lives were damaged because they could rely on secrecy. Even in the area of classification of documents, you get this perverse cycle where, just to be safe, people mark something as more classified than it needs to be. Then more people need that level of access to information so they can access the documents they need to do their job. And then, as a result, they get access to the information that they were never intended to have in the first place. If we're serious about keeping our documents secret, we need to be making more of them public. I think it's also worth noting that there's two different binaries here, and you've touched on one, that we trade off transparency with security. But when it comes to the secrets of private citizens, the government doesn't approach it as a transparency security trade-off. Then they talk about a privacy versus security trade-off. So when it's their secrets, those are keeping the nation safe. When it's your secrets, those are putting the nation in danger. <laughs> um, and not letting them get away with that, I think, is an important part here. Um, the reality is that personal as well as government information sometimes needs to be kept secret. But even when it comes to something like security clearances, uh, which public servants and military officials and so on need to get before they get access to information and, and certain areas. When you undergo a security clearance, the government is not impressed by your ability to keep a secret. Quite the opposite. What they want is you to be open about your travel, about your relationships, about your drug and alcohol use, and so on. Uh, because they know that if they know about those things, they can manage them. It's the secrecy it's the secrets that make you an unsafe public that servant. That compromise people, essentially. So, yeah, that's a really actually a great example of where governments are looking for transparency and that actually functions to increase security. Together we can and will establish a National Anti-Corruption Commission. Together we can be a self-reliant, resilient nation, confident in our values and in our place in the world. And together we can embrace the Uluru Statement from the Heart. What do we know about how this government, and in particular the Prime Minister, thinks about transparency? When he became opposition leader, Anthony Albanese started very strong on transparency. Uh, in that year, he gave a speech called Labour and Democracy, and I'll read a little bit of it now. He said, we need a culture of disclosure. Protect whistleblowers. Expand their protections and the public interest test. Reform freedom of information laws so they can't be flouted by government. The current delays, obstacles, costs, and exemptions make it easier for the government to hide information from the public. That is just not right. 
and examples of the reforms he identified were donation disclosures, which we don't yet have, parliamentary debate of the decision to go to war, which hasn't been locked in, standing orders to ensure ministers give sensible answers in question time, and the whole Uluru statement, including truth-telling as priorities. Uh, And it's an eagle-eyed journalist from the Australian Financial Review, Mark DiStefano, who noticed a certain irony with what's happened to that speech, which is that earlier this year it was taken down from the Prime Minister's website. Is that right? So it's no longer publicly available? It's back after he made inquiries. (laughs) It was blamed on a technical error. Um, But the irony of a speech about the importance of disclosure going missing was not missed on him. (laughs) Uh, And even if the speech is returned, the sentiments are still missing from the Albanese government. We have seen welcome reform, and the NAC is a good example of that. The Administrative Appeals Tribunal uh, has been replaced, but even before it was replaced, the Albanese government stuck to an open recruitment process, and they followed that approach in other areas as well, the ABC board, for example. We've gotten one tranche of whistleblower reforms, but fairly technical changes. The bigger changes are promised, but not delivered. Overall, the Albanese government more closely resembles the coalition governments that preceded it than the big dose of Australian sunshine that he promised in his speech as opposition leader. Mm. One of the key pieces of legislation that you've just referred to is around political donations reform. You said we haven't quite seen that yet. Where is that up to in the parliament? We're not really sure where the Albanese government's changes to donation laws are up to. Uh, They've been promised for the last few sitting periods and not eventuated. Uh, The minister responsible, the special minister for state, Don Farrell, has identified in broad strokes the kind of changes he's looking to make. It's a mixture of uh, reforms that have a well-established pedigree, so increasing the transparency of political donations would be very welcome. At the moment, donations under about $16,000 slip under the radar. We found out recently that dinner with a minister can cost just a few thousand dollars. So cash for access comes cheap in Australia. And when you've got a donation disclosure threshold that is many times higher than the cost of access, it means the public doesn't find out about who's trying to influence politicians and to what end. Um, But there are others that are more worrying. So donation and spending caps, which Australia Institute Research finds at the state level, can actually limit people's access to government and entrench the financial power of a few players have been fated. And there's serious reason for concern that those might actually entrench the power of incumbents at the expense of challenges and new entrants. So essentially, there's a risk that if we don't get these donation laws right, that all we're doing is entrenching Labor and Liberal forever and kind of really putting some huge barriers in for new or independent or smaller parties to really be competitive, I guess. That's right. Although most of the concern about large political donations is about them going to parties of government Mm -hmm. and affecting the decisions of government. When you look at where parties get their funding, the major parties tend to be less dependent on fundraising than others. The major parties can extract levies from their MPs, they get large amounts of public funding, which is not available to new entrants, and they've accumulated assets over many decades. So they're insulated from the effect of limits on donations, even though it's their donations that are of the greatest concern. So given everything that we've spoken about, what strategy should the parliament, as opposed to the government, I guess, be pursuing in order to ensure that legislation like the donations reform is as rigorous as it needs to be. What I'd like to see from the parliament is it fulfilling its duties as a legislature. So we have particularly the Senate as a house of review, but both houses of parliament are there to review and amend legislation, to hold inquiries into the possible effects it would have, uh, and to reach compromise between many different groups with many different interests. So when the Albanese government presents its proposed changes to political finance laws, uh, the parliament just needs to do what it's there to do, investigate what their likely effects are, 
split off the achievable and straightforward, like truth in political advertising, which we know works from South Australia, split that off from the more complicated and fraught questions and spend more time considering them to make sure that what passes into Australian law is constitutional and democratic. Mm. Bill, I talked at the beginning of this podcast about the public's kind of right to know information. I mean, governments are elected, well, parliament is elected by the people it's supposed to be for the people. And getting access to information sometimes seems to be really hard, even though we've got freedom of information laws. What kind of reforms do we need to see there? And what are some of the issues that we've come up against as a research institute trying to access public information? One of the really interesting panels at the Transparency Summit brought together Professor John McMillan, who is the former information commissioner, uh, with Rex Patrick, the transparency warrior, who is a very active FOI applicant, and Isabel Reinecke of the Grata Fund, which funds litigation for freedom of information court cases. And the real picture that emerged from that is that to get the most out of FOI law, you really want to be a former senator. <laughs> I mean, Rex Patrick, he's, he knows how the system works and he gets results, but at an enormous cost of resources. And that's not how it should be. The idea is to open up the decisions of government to members of the public, um, but that can often mean waiting for months or years it can mean having the media savvy to turn an uh, adverse FOI decision into something that's still consequential and useful. Uh, and it can mean having the legal and funding support to take court cases to get the information that the court then confirms you were always entitled, entitled to, to in the first place. I mean, yeah, that does seem like an ass backwards way to go about it. And almost the total opposite of what freedom of information laws are supposed to do. That's right. And I mentioned in the speech that uh, listeners may remember Scott Morrison's negative globalism speech mm -hmm. from 2019. It uh, is pre-COVID. Uh, and about a, a year after the speech, we put in a freedom of information request for the international reaction to what the prime minister had said. Uh, and our request for a review of that decision is still on foot in 2024, <laughs> four years after the application, five years after the speech, long after Scott Morrison has left parliament, let alone stopped being prime minister. Now, a delay like that protects politicians from the consequences of their decision and stops the public from being able to hold them to account for the things that are done in their name. I guess in the same way as justice transparency delayed is transparency denied. Definitely. Thanks for joining us on the show today, Bill. Thanks a lot for having me. If you want to watch sessions from the Transparency Summit, you can find them via the Australia Institute on YouTube or by following the link in the episode description. We would love to hear your thoughts on the show today and you can reach out to us via email at podcasts at australiainstitute.org.au or you can find us on Twitter at the Oz Institute with an AUS. Our theme music is by Jonathan McFeet from Pulse and Thrum with additional music from Blue Dot Sessions. I'm Ebony Bennett. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.